Better get that child some water. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, turn to Jeremiah 31, please. Jeremiah 31. As I said this morning, there was something new that was coming. It was prophesied. We're going to read that prophecy. And a lot of people in the world today still cling to the old. And I don't know really why. You know, I've, I've had studies and have asked that question. Why is it that people still, why do you still cling to, well, I just believe that uh, we are still under the old law and if we keep the Ten Commandments, we're children of God and if we keep the Ten Commandments, we can go to heaven. And You hear all kinds of things, but when you, when you ask them, if people that believe that, when you ask them, have you really taken time to read Jeremiah 31, Hebrews 8, and other passages of Scripture? And they will say, well, no, this is just what I believe. We have a lot of that in the world today where people believe what they believe because they choose to believe it without ever investigating what Scripture has to say. As I said this morning, I love this book for many, many reasons, one of which is because God saw to it that we have the rules. We have the rule book, if you will. And, that, and the, the Word of God is not just a, a rule book, but just give me that example for this uh, sermon. We have the rule book right before us where we can look and we can see exactly what God wants from us. And that works in our, or on our behalf. And it also is, is something that will work against us if we don't take advantage of seeing what the Word of God has to say. So let's just look at Jeremiah 31 for just a second. Begin at verse 31. You should never forget where this verse is. Jeremiah 31, 31. Watch what the prophecy says. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Now he's referring to the old covenant, obviously, the law of Moses and all those other things. He says something new is coming with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Say, it's coming. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them, now here's a clue, out of the land of Egypt. So we can't miss this. There is something new that's coming to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Something that's not like what their fathers had. Well, you know, just, just, let's just hone in on this. What are you talking about? It's not what I gave whenever they came out of Egypt. Now, what was that? Ten Commandments, we understand. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Something new is coming. Now, whenever we look at this, we, we must ask the question, and that's the title of tonight's lesson, what makes the new covenant new? What is it about it that makes it new? Why not the old law? Why the new? Well, let's look at, if you will, please, look at Hebrews chapter 8. I want to go quite hurriedly this evening because I have a lot to cover. Hebrews chapter 8. By the way, I am so impressed with our young people. I really am. And Reuben, you're doing a great job with them, but brother. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13. In speaking of a new covenant, now this idea I've told you before means like one never seen before. But speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. Now, what we're about to read, the book of Hebrews was written, people believe, somewhere between 60 and 70. A lot of people place it there. And so this is written, well, let me, let me get, let's just read the last part and let me tie something in here. And what is a becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now there was a prophecy in the Old Testament in Daniel 9 and verse 27. And the prophecy is during that time when sacrifices are going to end. It would come to an end. The reason this says that it's becoming obsolete was because in the first century they're still holding on to this old law. 70 A.D. Whenever the destruction of the temple came, which I believe was the prophecy in Daniel 9, 27, the sacrifices stopped. The genealogy of the, the, the ancestral records that the Jews had and, and about which they, they held so closely to, it was all gone at the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. 
So he says, it's becoming obsolete. What's becoming obsolete is growing old and ready to vanish away. Now he's saying, listen, the new has come. Well, let's, let's look at several things here. Number one, under the old law, they had a priesthood that was only for men, the Arianic and the Levitical priesthood. Now, all Christians, all believers, are a royal priesthood. Now, this is going to really come into play. What makes the, the new law new is because, even though they're borrowing some of the terminology, and rightfully so because it explains it so well, even under the old law, ladies, this ought to make you, even though, even though there are things in the Lord's church, responsibilities and things that God has deemed necessary for only men to do. Now, we can argue, and you know, a lot of the, the feminism or feminist movement, I would say, uh, a lot of the arguments they make because they think that the way the Word of God is, that, that God would be chauvinist. But you see, if God created us and God had the plan, you can't have it both ways. Now, you may stand up and say, I don't believe in God because of this and this and this. But if you believe in the Word of God, you should go by what the Word of God has to say. Amen? And you ought to go by what it says. So the, the whole idea of this is, and I'll get to the, to the liberating factor here in just a second. But we all know that in God's, under God's commands, that He does not permit a woman to teach a man. Now, that's in, a, in that scenario, we understand what's being said. That's another sermon, another time. We know that when we talk about elders and deacons, elders always are men. And they have certain qualifications, some 26, 24 to 26, depending on what translation you read. When it comes to deacons, people run to the idea of, of Romans chapter 16 and Phoebe. Well, the Bible says that Phoebe was a deaconess. Well, in a, a strict understanding of that, it's from the word diakonos, which means deacon, or means through the dust. And it means literally a servant. Not that she fulfilled the capacity of an office of a deacon. That's not what it's saying. So as we look at all of these things, uh, because we see in, in Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3, we see the qualifications for deacons, and there isn't any way a woman can meet those qualifications. Now we understand that. And so the whole idea of these things, and, and by the examples that we have, we understand there are different responsibilities for us. But in saying all of that, it doesn't mean that men are greater than women. It doesn't mean that the woman is lesser spiritually. It just means God says, look, I'm putting the responsibility where I want the responsibility. You may not like it. You may want to argue with it, but I put it where I want it. And that's exactly why God says, men, you're the head of the house. And being the head of the house comes into play in the, in the Lord's church in so many, many, many ways. And so we look at this, and yet we find that all of us, all men and women, I'm going to say this properly, all men and women are ministers of the Word of God. Now, it doesn't mean that you are a minister as I am a minister, you know, not an evangelist or someone that stands before and preaches to the people, but certain we, certainly we all minister to other people. We all care about them, we care for them, we pray for them, all these different things. But look at what the Word of God says, 1 Peter 2, about verse 9. Under the old law, priesthood was only for the man. Now watch this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people, talking about all of us, a people for his own possession. Now there's a reason why. Why does he come along and say, okay, Galatians chapter 3, now there is no more, there isn't any more Jew or Gentile, male or female. And we look around, we say, wait a minute, Jack, there's a male and there's a female, a male and a, I can tell the difference between a man and a woman and a woman and a man. Well, what he's saying is, concerning the idea of, of value or importance or concerning the idea of spirituality, he says, listen, all of you are just as important as one another. You have different roles, but the same importance to Almighty God. And all of the roles being done together is what keeps the church functioning the way the church is supposed to function. So therein lies the beauty of this. But notice this. 
that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Boy, you talk about being liberated for all of us. Now, uh, on a twofold note, number one, we are Gentile people that now have been let in. Romans chapter 11, we, we've been grafted into that olive tree, if you remember correctly. It's not only now that the, the Israel is a chosen, chosen people, but now we Gentiles have been grafted in. So the beauty of this is we all can serve Almighty God and God looks to see whether we do or not. Under the old law, the high priest was only the only one that went into the, that's the next slide. Under the old law, the high priest was the only one to go into the Holy of Holies. Now all Christians have access to it. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, 14 through 16. And the, the idea, and I could have gone to another place, I just wanted to go here. <clears throat> But under the old law, if you remember, he'd enter in once a year, make the sacrifice for the people. The, the, the tabernacle was divided into, into two places. You had the holy and you had the holy of holies. And in the holy of holies was the Ark of the Covenant. Remember that? And so he would go in there and he'd take a hyssop branch and, and dip it in blood and sprinkle on the mercy seat, the top part of the Ark of the Covenant, sprinkle that blood on there, and it would be for the, for the sacrifice, or if you will, for the sins of the people. And now he comes along and he said, listen, you had, to be the, you had to be a high priest. You had to be the guy in order to go there. And now all of a sudden, look at Ephesians 2, 14 and 16, for he, talking about Christ himself, is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that's the old law, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, no longer Jew or Gentile, but now just Christian, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. You have in Acts eleven twenty six, 26, in Acts 26 and verse 28, 1 Peter 4 and verse 16. Three times in Scripture the Bible uses the word Christian. Do you know that? Christian from Christ and from Ion, which I mentioned before, meaning follower. What does Christian mean? Follower of Christ. He says, so now, let me tell you this, this is the beauty. Because of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ has made, now under the new law, under this new covenant, we are all a chosen people. We are all a royal priesthood. And we are, we are all to gain and to have access into the Holy of Holies. Boy, I like that. Now, let's get to another part of this. Under the old law, they gave animal sacrifices. Now all Christians are asked to sacrifice in a different way. Look at Romans 12 and verse 1. Romans 12 and verse 1. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, an appeal could be to beseech or to beg. I beg you, therefore, brothers, and this is the reason I'm doing it, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as, now underline this next, these next two words, because under the old laws, I've told you, a sacrifice went to the altar, and it didn't get off that altar, it died. He said, but I'm calling you under the new law, that you, your bodies individually, Male and female, serving me, I am I'm commanding you that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. You lay yourself down. You understand, you, you make those sacrifices before Almighty God, and it says, holy, in other words, separated and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, or a better translation, I believe, act of service. So part of my serving God, and sometimes we miss this, part of my serving God is make, uh, involves making these, these living sacrifices. You know, what? we could take that to the nth degree, but I think all of us understand what a sacrifice is. Sometimes sacrificing hurts, doesn't it? Sometimes it's, it's not always comfortable, comfortable to make a living sacrifice. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, maybe we have to get away from a, a habit. Maybe we have to walk away from a, a friendship. Sometimes it's not always easy. 
Sometimes even, even making those sacrifices, even when it comes to, and if we have a point, well, I'll get to the giving part here in a minute, but even coming to, to, to our giving, I think that's even part of it. Sometimes we, we make those sacrifices because we put God first. How is it that you give as much as you can? Because you put God first. You see, that's the whole idea. A lot of times in our, in our giving, and that's what the, the uh, Jews would do. I'll get to that a little later on. But it's what the Jews would do under the old law. We always talk about this 10% tithing. But whenever you study it, it's over 30%, sometimes up around 35% that they would give. Now, how could they give that much, and why would they give that much? Because it was a sacrifice to them, Right? They had part of that sacrifice, and, and this, is, this is where it comes together. Part of the sacrifice, even in our giving, in our, in our monetary gift back to God, which demonstrates from our heart how much we love God, how much we are thankful to God, and how much we are on the page of making sure the Lord's church grows. But you see, part of that is the idea of sacrifice. Now, let's look at another, another point here. Under the old law, they worshiped in a temple. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, please. You get the idea? All these different things, the royal priesthood, uh, the holy of holies, the sacrificing. They worshiped in a temple. Now watch. Now we are the church and our bodies are temples. Watch this. Or do you not know, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you. Now watch this. Whom you have from God, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Under the old law, they worshiped in a temple. Everybody realizes that. Now we are a royal priesthood making sacrifices, living sacrifices. Our bodies are the temple. We are the church. So we come together. We are called out. That's what the word ecclesia means. The church, the called out. That's why when Hebrews 10 and verse 25, when the Bible talks about not forsaking the assembly, I believe it's talking there specifically about the Lord's day. Now, although the day there is the second coming of Christ, I believe, that's mentioned. But it's because God has called out the church. That's why, verse 26, it's a sin not to be here. Brother Jack, you can't say that. I don't have to. The Word of God does. So as we look at that, how are we to worship? Well, part of, part of worshiping God is being where God wants you to be. Amen? So here we are. And another point here. Under the old law, they sacrificed the blood of animals. Under the new covenant, we are asked to remember the one and only sacrifice for man's sin. Look at this, Matthew 26, 27, and 28. And he, talking about Jesus, took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink, all, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Hmm. So under the old law, they had animal sacrifices. Under the new law, he says, animal sacrifices, blood. Under the new law, he says, you don't have to have a backyard full of sacrifices. You don't have to worry about that anymore. No longer will your sins be rolled forward as they were under the old law. Now, under the new law, your sins are going to be forgiven because that perfect teleon, that perfect, complete sacrifice has come. Now, look at 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 25, where Paul spoke of what Christ said also. He says this, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 25. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So now we're beginning to get the idea of what makes the new new. What makes the idea of, of, the, uh, of the, the old, of the new law, new, the new covenant? Well, it's not because, and please listen to this, write this down if you're taking notes. The new covenant is not new because we don't have any law. That is a misunderstanding, a misnomer, a misquote. 
1 Corinthians 9, 21 says, we're under the law of Christ. You see, some people think, well, now that we're under the, uh, we're under the idea of grace, we have no law. But the truth of the matter is, we still have rules and regulations and things we are bound to keep. Amen? So we have to keep that in mind. Under the old law, certain instruments of worship were allowed in worship. Certain instruments of music were allowed in worship. And a lot of times they would have a, a trumpet call to worship. We went over those before. There weren't that many. And a lot of people believe that they had whole orchestras and bands and everything else. Not so. But under the new covenant, God tells us the instrument He allows in worship. If you look, we're going to get there, Ephesians 5 and verse 19. Watch this. I'm going to go over this carefully because the word used for singing here is solo or solentes. Now watch this. Addressing one another. One another, I told you before, is a reciprocal reflexive pronoun. It means it's done mutually at the same time. Now I want you to notice under the old law, none of us in here would ever doubt. As a matter of fact, Amos 5 says God wasn't pleased because of their hearts and their, you know, the, the, the instrument and all of this. And, and God didn't want their sacrifices or their prayers or their instruments of worship or whatever. But addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, there it is, singing. That means to strike, to pluck, to pick, to twang. That's what it means. And if it were left by itself, it would be to us, we'd say, well, wow. You know, that just kind of leaves it open. But it gives us the instrument there, church. We can argue with it all we want to, but there isn't any way you can come to this verse and say, inherent in this verse and the idea of singing means you have to play an instrument. If that's true, we're all in trouble, right? Because this verse is given not to Jack Smith alone, but to each and every one of us in this building. And if the inherent in singing here means we have to play an instrument, all of us do. Or all of us are in violation of that. Whatever that is, whenever they came together, and I believe it can be argued it's corporate worship because one another here is that mutual edifying, that mutual singing one to another. So when you come together, this is what I want you to do. I want you to sing, and here's the instrument I want you to use, making melody to the Lord with your heart. You know the argument as well as I do. But it's there. I have never, ever, I've debated this issue more than one time with people that believe in using an instrument. And whenever I pose this question, will you please tell me I am sinful or wrong if we never use an instrument? I've never yet had a single person tell me we believe you're sinful if you don't use one. Do you think I'm absolutely right without using one? I can't say you're not absolutely right without using one. Then what's the problem? Here we go, we come to this. Look, please, at Colossians 3.16. Hold on just a second, Colossians 3.16. What's different about the old law and the new law? Here we go, Colossians 3.16. Now we can say, that's just not fair, I don't like that. One person said, and I've got a sermon, I've, I've been, again, I know I preached a whole series, six lessons, I believe, on instrumental music a few years ago, but I've got another one sitting on my desk where I really want to, I want to show you, you know what, and I'm going to mention some names here, and I don't normally do this, but what some of the, um, of what were considered scholars of the Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Baptist Church, what they all believed about it in the beginning. And it has, it has a relevance to this argument of what we're talking about here because not always, and see, if, if we're not careful, we're going to think always all these people that use instruments now, they always did. Not so. Matter of fact, they, they, a lot of these instruments came into worship service after the kicking and screaming. Why? Because they realized at the beginning, in the first century, they didn't use them. It was an invention of man. Now watch this. Let... Now, there's a, the release point here, if you will. Let, that means that we have to give, give permission, but let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How do I do that? Teaching and admonishing one another. There's that one another, that personal pronoun again. In all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. 
both passages of Scripture. I want you to sing, and this is what I want you to do. I want you to make melody in your heart. I want you to have thankfulness in your heart. But this is what I want you to do. I want you to sing. Hebrews 13 and verse 15. The Bible says, with the fruit of the lips you shall praise Him. Word of God, I believe it's 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 15. The Bible says, I will sing with the Spirit and with the understanding, and I will pray with the Spirit and the understanding. If I can, if I can sing there with an instrument, why can't I pray with one? Same way I sing is the same way I pray. Church, we can go on and on and on about this, make all kinds of, of arguments, but you know the truth of the matter is, why not cease from stepping across a line when we don't have to step across a line? So here we go. Under the old law, the last one, people were commanded to tithe at least 10%. Under the new covenant, we give as we have prospered. And the point there, God looks to see where our hearts are. Now that's the whole idea here. Boy, I like our system better. I don't have to give 10%. don't have to do this. You know, this is, and this is totally up to us. You know, that's the, that's the bottom line. It's totally up to us how we give. But all of us must understand. Do we really believe that now that since Jesus gave His Son, that Jesus says, now I'm looking to see if my people will give less? Really? What's the best way and the only way, what's the only way that God will know whether or not we're serious about our serving Him and worshiping Him? Now, my answer may surprise you because you may say, well, Jack, you're talking about just the way we give? No, I'm talking about the way we're committed to Him, the way we are involved. And certainly committed and involved involves this. But look at 1 Corinthians 16, and we're going to close. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. Now there are those who argue that this was a specific time, a special time, and it was done because of taking up a collection, because it was going to be going to a missionary effort, or a special reason here. But I beg to differ because it says on the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and in and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. So there is a precedent here as we look at what's going on. He said, what's the difference between the old and the new? And the old, God says, it's going to be this much. On the new, he says, I'm leaving it up to you, but you understand you're living in the era of, of grace and mercy and forgiveness, but my eyes are still on you. So therein lies the beauty of this. So I want you to give as you've prospered. Well, there's just a little bit. I've just touched the hem of the garment of the difference between the old and the new. I read a lot in the Old Testament. I read more in the New Testament. I have to admit that. And I like living under the New Testament. I like the New Covenant, don't you? I like that. Having a, a backyard full of sacrifices, I don't know if I can handle that. Do I look like a sheep herder to you? I have trouble with a poodle. Yes, I've wanted to sacrifice him a time or two. But we understand the difference, don't we, between the old and the new? But under both of them, there was something that was so akin that we can't run away from it. And that is the idea of serving him and taking it seriously. Oh, Brother Jack, under the old, I just don't understand. You know, they had this and this and this. They had to do all these different things and, and all of that. And Oh, I don't know. God still demanded service. Dalton preached to us about Uzzah. A magnificent job he did about Uzzah. And maybe we don't understand. Maybe we still don't understand. What do you mean? He reached out and steadied the ark and God took his life? I don't understand that. Well, <laughs> what about it don't you understand? Whenever you tell me you don't understand that, what it means is you don't like that. I don't like that. Well, that's one thing. Understanding it's something else. 
Because when God says something, God means something. Maybe tonight you have never responded to be baptized into Christ. Maybe you need prayer for strength. Whatever it is, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.